flip between two things that I really want to work with to kind of show you um, about the, the issues of water in Israel and Palestine. Um, I have a PowerPoint which, you know, basically to show you my pretty pictures of uh, when I was in uh, working with the Friends of the Earth Middle East uh, in on a study tour um, last March. Um, so I was there in March and worked uh, really looking at the Jordan River, uh, environmental issues in Israel and Palestine, and really looking at how citizen uh, environmental activism in the region is trying to find ways to solve the problem um, from the ground up. So there we're not talking about Israel on one side and Palestine, Palestinians on the other side as you know uh, um, heterogeneous or, or homogeneous conflict groups that are only opposed to one another, but really looking at who are the people on both sides who are trying to ameliorate conditions on the ground and to see how civil society is trying to overcome the blockage at the top, right? Um, and that's one of the ways that I'm really interested in, in looking at a lot of these issues is to try and find out not just where the blockages are but where the potential is for energy working in the other direction because there's no point solving the problems up here if you don't also have civil society working together to actually move things forward on the ground, right? You need both things happening. And so um, it's good to see that at least there's some movement from the groundswell because there's really very little going on at the top about which we can be optimistic at this point in time. But hope springs eternal. Guys, there's plenty of room over here and I am not at all I'm not formal, and also, I really don't want this to be a lecture. And I think it was called a lecture, but I hated those when I was younger, and I've retained a hatred for them. So I really would rather have a conversation. So I'll show you stuff that I think is cool, object to it, comment on it, ask questions about it, and we will all have far more fun. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some of the PowerPoint, and then I will say, oh, wait, but I really want to show you that on Google Earth, so I'm going to quit out of the PowerPoint and go over to Google Earth, and then we're going to look at what it looks like using Google Earth, because I really think seeing it in its um, really geospatial context is very helpful for figuring out why some of these issues are so difficult to solve. So, <coughs> sorry, and I also flew in today, and my throat is very, very dry. So I think that um, three of the ways that I want to look at this, and these are all very interpenetrated um, uh, contexts, is to look at water as geography and water as politics and water as um, a social impact. Um, and of course, you know, you, you have to start out with water as geography. We have to start out from science, right? Um, this is obviously a region of the world that's quite arid. Um, there is rain-fed agriculture. There has always been rain-fed agriculture in this region. Um, there, it's actually indigenous populations, and by that I mean the many different indigenous populations that have been in this area, have been very smart over millennia of figuring out how you survive um, in a very arid environment. Um, and so you have a lot of crops that are still being grown uh, very effectively that don't require a lot of water. So there are adaptations to this very arid environment that populations have used over time, <clears throat> the most important of which is the olive, right? The olive tree is the symbol of the Palestinian people to a certain extent exactly because it is perfectly adapted to its environment. It is an extremely hardy and long-lived tree with extremely deep roots so that it can weather long periods of drought. And this is one of the reasons that Palestinians have adopted the olive tree as the kind of national symbol, right? Because of its deep rootedness, it's indigenous to the region, um, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there's a, um, a very kind of emotional context in which the olive tree is seen as, as that personal national symbol, but it's also a symbol of um, how you can survive very well in an environment that can be seen from, from a water-rich society like ours as being um, very poor in resources and very challenging and dangerous and unforgiving kind of environment, right? So we tend to look at the Middle East in general as a desert, which it isn't. We tend to look at um, Israel-Palestine as a place that's very challenging because of its aridity. But in fact, there are many ways in which um, people can be very successful at agriculture, fishing, etc., a whole variety of economic activities, as long as they're done in a way 
that does not overtax a very delicately balanced ecosystem. And that's part of what we're going to look at tonight is how that ecosystem has in fact uh, been pushed in terms of water really to the brink. So if we look at, um, now see I immediately want to run to my, okay, let's immediately run to um, Google Earth and go up and look at, sorry, I don't know why it wants to keep doing that. So here we have Israel, the West Bank, and Gaza. So you can see it from uh, up high. And what I want to do is kind of show you where the water comes from. So there are two major sources of water for Israelis and Palestinians. There is a small amount of rainfall that is collected in surface water and filters down into aquifers. And then there's, so, so there are springs, um, and then there's also rainfall, right? Uh, but if we look at the tributaries, it keeps wanting to do this. There are three major tributaries to the one major river system in Israel-Palestine, which is, of course, the Jordan River system. And here we have the Dan River, right? The Dan is um, the only one of these three rivers that actually arises in Israel itself. So of the tributaries of the Jordan River, only the Dan arises in... That's really dark. I don't know why it's so... It doesn't help at all, does it? Hmm. You want us to lower the light? Oh, uh, yeah, maybe a little bit. Maybe that will help. I don't know if it has one of those complicated things where you can turn off the front ones. No sleeping, Mr. Jellag. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, then we have further to the west, the Banyas River. The Banyas uh, arises from the Golan Heights right, in Syria, which has been occupied by uh, Israel, of course, since the 1967 war. And then we have the Hasbani over in Lebanon, which was in the part of Israel that had been occupied by, the, the part of Lebanon that had been occupied by Israel as part of the security zone until the Israelis pulled out of Lebanon. So now it's in um, Lebanese controlled territory. So you have these three rivers. Let me come up so you can see again. I don't know why this is way over there. So here we have the Benyes, the Dan, and the Hasbani here. And the three of them, wow, why is it so dark? Did we not do that as good as we can do on lights? Without being able to, okay. It won't look that well. I'm not afraid of the dark. <laughs> Just to give you a sense of, of what it looks from the headwaters of the Jordan. Doesn't really, it's not going to work. You see down here. That's a little better. Okay, there we go. So here we have the Banyas, the Dan, and the Hasbani, and they're coming down here along the Jordan River to <coughs> the Lake of Three Names, right? Um, the Sea of Galilee, uh, Lake Tiberias, or Lake Kinneret, known by all three names by different communities, right? So this is the largest reservoir um, for fresh water for uh, Israel. Um, and it's the place where Israel gets most of its groundwater from, right? So the Israeli national water carrier pumps enormous amounts of water out of the Sea of Galilee over here by Tiberias and takes it out into all the way down to the Negev Desert, right? So this is the kind of fundamental reservoir. And then up here, you can see this area that I have outlined in blue. This is the Hula Valley. This used to be marsh, right? Again, we don't think of Israel, Palestine as having marshes. Um, this used to be an enormous marsh, and it's actually very important because this whole region is um, along, it's the very tip of the African Rift Valley, and it's where most of the European uh, migrating bird species migrate up from Africa through the African Rift, and they used to come right up along the Jordan River into Europe, right? So it was a really important waterway for these migrating species because there, were, there are very few surface freshwater uh, sources in this area, right? So they really need the Jordan River. Well, um, at some point after the founding of Israel and the idea of the Israeli state as greening the desert and becoming agriculturally self-sufficient, etc., um, it was decided to drain the marshes and to use all of this land, and you can see it here, right? You can see that distinctive patterning of large-scale agriculture, right? All of those squares and the 
you know, circular irrigation, right? So that whole area was drained and used for large-scale commercial agriculture um, until they realized that the soil was getting very saline. It was a real problem because it still collected water from the winter rains and it wasn't draining because it's a swamp. So they realized that what they needed to do was to reconstitute at least part of it. And by that I mean this little tiny place right here um, is being reconstituted uh, constituted as a natural wildlife area and swamp. Right? So they're trying to reclaim a very small portion of it um, and a little bit along here uh, where the Jordan River is, right? To try and reclaim some of that uh, natural wildlife area. Then we come down here to the Sea of Galilee, Lake Tiberias, Lake Kinneret. Am I going to offend anybody if I just call it Galilee from now on? Okay, good. Um, so then we go from there. Let me come up. And you can see the river is the border here between Jordan and um, the West Bank. Um, and then we have another tributary coming in from the uh, east, the Yarmouk River, that joins the um, Jordan River and comes down here to everybody's favorite destination, the Dead Sea, which um, is much deader now than it used to be. So we'll look at that as well. So then we have the Dead Sea. Now if we come up again and look over to the sea, look over to the sea, look over to the sea. I don't know why it's all... There we go. It's a little bit better. So here's the Mediterranean. And here you can see the Gaza Strip down here, Israel, and the West Bank, okay? So I just want you to notice something, which is, even on this, even with the bad color contrast that we have, how much greener much of northern Israel is and the coastal strip is than most of the West Bank, right? So there are much better water resources even naturally on the coastal plain than on the hilly parts of the West Bank. So the West Bank is an area that's more challenged in terms of natural resources anyway. Um, but the really interesting thing is to look here at these aquifers, okay? These are the three main aquifers. Let me make north on top just so that we're all more comfortable looking at our map. These are the three aquifers that supply underground water, right, to Israelis and Palestinians. So we have one aquifer, the coastal aquifer here along the coast, the western aquifer here, and the eastern aquifer here, okay? Now you can see that major portions of um, the uh, eastern and western aquifer both lie under the west bank, and then the coastal aquifer goes from Gaza all the way up along the shore. Now, these are the most important groundwater sources. They're meant to be a natural reservoir. The problem is that uh, for a very long time, um, the Israelis have been pulling more water out of the aquifers than they can replenish through natural rainwater seeping down into the, the aquifers, right? So what happens when you pull more water out of an aquifer than it replenishes? The level goes down, right? You get lots of surface phenomena like sinkholes, right? Because you're pulling water out, which means that you have a lowering of pressure in all those sedimentary layers, right? So often, the sediment will simply collapse. And the other thing that happens is that in the rock, as that pressure goes down, it's a vacuum. It sucks other stuff in. And the other stuff it sucks in is very often, especially along the coast, seawater. Right? So the coastal aquifer for a couple of decades now has been thirstily sucking in seawater from the Mediterranean and it is now, look at it, one third of the freshwater resources available to um, uh, Israel-Palestine and the only source available to Gaza, it is undrinkable. You told me, didn't you say you drank some water from Gaza and it tasted like? Seawater. Seawater. Right? It is almost as saline as seawater. It is, by World Health standards, undrinkable. Um, so people in Gaza rely either on water piped or trucked in from Israel, from the other aquifers, 
or they simply drink the water that they can afford, which is the water that comes up from these salinated wells. So you have very high um, uh, incidence of um, saline disease and fluoridosis, other things, because it's not just salt in the water. When we say salt, when we're talking about salinization, we mean a whole host of minerals, including some heavy metals that are carcinogenic. All of these things are coming in. The other thing that happens with these aquifers is that the water that filters down into them from the winter rains is water that's coming down from the surface. So they bring with them all of the contaminants that they find on the surface that they dissolve into them. So all those solutes come down into the aquifer and that means it's agricultural runoff, it's untreated sewage, it's uh, land running through landfills, it's industrial waste, and all of these materials are also filtering down. And part of the biggest problem is that while in Israel proper, there are reasonably strong environmental protections about the disposal of waste and sewage, in Gaza, in the, under the Palestinian Authority, and in the settlements in the West Bank, there are far fewer at least enforced regulations about the disposal of sewage, about industrial waste, about land waste, etc. Um, and certainly on agricultural runoff. So there is an enormous amount of pollutant that comes down into these aquifers because of uh, the rainwater spilling into the aquifer and bringing all of those surface pollutants in. Does that make sense? So I just want to give you that kind of geographical overview and then we'll come back to the PowerPoint. We can come back to um, uh, play with Google Earth later on, if we like. OK, so, so that's the geography of the area. We have these three sources of water, the water in the aquifers that's been there for a long time, the replenishment of those aquifers from the winter rains, and uh, the, the springs, et cetera, that feed the Jordan River and its tributaries. So the other, the thing about water though is that it's not just that there's not enough water to go around. There might barely be enough water to go around right now if it were equally distributed, but it isn't, okay? The problem with water is that it's political because nobody is secure if they don't have access to water, right? Israelis are not secure if they don't have access to water. Palestinians are not secure if they don't have access to water. So both groups of leaders have it as an extremely high priority, and not both groups of leaders, sorry, it's also all of the surrounding riparian states. So Syria isn't secure if they don't have water, Jordan isn't secure if they don't have water, Lebanon isn't secure if they don't have water, although they have more natural sources of water as it is. So all of these surrounding states have a very high interest in taking as much water as possible from the, Israel, from the, the available sources before the other guy gets it. Right? It's been seen as a zero sum game. That everybody wants to get as much as they can for themselves, which means that the more powerful actors are able to control more of the water resources. So that we can see, for example, after the 1967 war, that Israel occupied the Golan Heights and has been extremely reluctant to, as the Syrians have, to engage in real dialogue to change it, uh, its status back to being under uh, Syrian sovereignty. Part of the reason is that um, you know, there's a security problem with having these heights overlooking um, very prosperous areas of, of Israel. However, <clears throat> in these days of modern warfare, when we're talking about distances of you know, 20 to 40 miles, um, you know, anybody can lob a missile from a flat piece of land to another flat piece of land. You don't need to have heights anymore, but this isn't the Crusades. The real issue about the Golan Heights, or at least the bigger issue, is that that's one of the major, in fact, the most productive sources of the, the Jordan River. That's the Benyes, right? So if and Syria has said very clearly, if they regain control, they say, when they regain control of the Golan Heights, they will take their water back. They will not allow it to flow into Israel. So it's a very clear threat, and for Israel, it's, it, you know, um, um, talks frequently about the kind of existential threats they face in what they consider a very hostile neighborhood. They cannot imagine giving back the Golan Heights if it means that they will lose a third of the water coming into the Jordan River. Does that make sense? So it's control. Whoever has 
The upstream water controls who gets it downstream, right? The same way, whoever controls the aquifer controls who gets that water. And in that case, it's Israel that controls the aquifers. Not because Israel sits on top of them. In fact, as I said, much of the aquifers are actually under uh, the West Bank. But Israel, since 1967, and then in 1982, they passed all control of the water over to the Israeli national water carrier. So Israel controls much of the extraction of the water from the aquifer. Now there are Palestinian wells, there have always been Palestinian wells in the West Bank going down into the aquifers, the mountain aquifer. Um, however, the Palestinian wells are much shallower, they were dug with much less sophisticated equipment, um, and as more and more water has been pulled out of that mountain aquifer, most of the Palestinian wells have now gone dry. Right? And they are not allowed to get permits, for the most part, to dig new wells that are deeper. So Palestinians cannot independently access the aquifer water, and they have to get water from Israel. Right? Which means that, as Palestinians say, Israel's hand is always on the tap so that Israel can control access to the water. Now, in fact, under the Oslo Peace Accords, um, the agreement was that um, the Palestinians would get 20% of the water that Israel drew out of this aquifer that's largely under the West Bank, right? So the agreement was already that Palestinians would only get a fifth of that water. But in fact, they haven't always gotten a fifth of that water for a whole variety of reasons that we'll, we'll talk about later. So there's enormous conflict amongst West Bank Palestinians and uh, the Israeli state over access to water, that they're not getting uh, the water that they were promised. In addition, and exacerbating all of this, is the fact that, of course, there are an enormous number of settlers now living in the West Bank, about 500,000, and they have unrestricted access to the same water from those aquifers. So that Palestinian villages and settlements are side by side, one of them has unlimited water, and the other has very, very limited water. Right? Not that they have unlimited water in the settlements. I should be. Israelis actually have a very active campaign of being careful about water usage. But there are no legal limitations on what the settlers can draw in the same way that there are for the Palestinians. That is, that the Palestinians' water use is mon metered and monitored, and once they get a certain amount, it's cut off. In many, many parts of the West Bank, uh, Palestinians only have water for several hours a week. Right? You have one time when you can fill your tank, and then it's cut off for the rest of the week. Sometimes it's only once every two weeks, or even longer. And when there is a closure, when there is some kind of uh, military incident, then often neighborhoods can be cut off entirely as a punitive measure. So what happens when you turn the tap and nothing comes out, and you don't have any water? Well, you buy it off a truck. Right? So Palestinians often have to buy water at approximately 10 times the cost from tr truckers who fill up from the same water sources that are coming from the aquifers. Right? So this is part of, this is one of the major things that Palestinians are aggrieved about um, in their day-to-day -day lives that we hear almost nothing about, right? I mean, when was the last time you saw a news story on CNN about Palestinian access to water? It doesn't happen, right? We talk about this conflict only at the level of Netanyahu said, Obama said, the Oslo Accords. It's all up here, and it's very little about what Palestinians actually live day to day, what Israelis actually live day to day. And I think if we don't understand that from the ground, it's hard for us un to understand the political pressures on leaders or possibly political pressures that might be brought to bear more effectively on leaders for change. Does that make sense? Just a yeah. point. The, uh, if the tap doesn't uh, bring water when you turn it on, you go buy it from the truck. But if you're a Bedouin and your herds are dependent upon up 
water, you just don't go buy that type of water off the truck at 10 times the price. The sure, well most people can't afford to buy it at 10 times the price. So the problem is that you just don't have the water, right? What really happens is that um, for most uh, Israelis have four to five times as much water as Palestinians do. And depending on who you are as a Palestinian and what neighborhood you live in and how much political strife there might be between you and the national water carrier or the military, um, you may get very, very uh, little water at all. Right? And we'll look at more of that as we go through. Um, so. One other thing that we should talk about is that this is not something that's simply a government decision in Israel. Um, you have to, we have to break down when, one of my pet peeves I have to say is when we say Israel does or Israel says or Israel this because there's no such thing as just Israel, right? There's no such thing as just Palestine. There's no such thing as America. Right? We should know that this week, right? <laughs> that there's, when we talk about the American political system or decisions that are made by the American government, these are decisions that are fought over fiercely, are they not? Right? By powerful interest groups, by citizens groups, etc. Believe me, Israel is no less raucous than the United States. In fact, I would put it in order of magnitude above the United States in terms of its political raucousness and its political heterogeneity. So we think about Israel as being whatever Netanyahu said this week. But in fact, you have to look much more carefully at what's going on in the Israeli political system as well as in uh, uh, the Palestinian political systems to try and figure out what's going on, right? So if you look inside Israel, you see, for example, that just like in the United States, this is something we should all get, there's a really strong farm lobby. Right? And that's because at the founding of the Israeli state, before the founding of the Israeli state, there was a very strong movement of Jews who had moved to Palestine who were primarily urban, right? Jews in Europe were primarily urban people. They came to Israel and they had to become farmers. They had to figure out how to become farmers. But they didn't want to just become farmers, they wanted to become the best possible farmers. They wanted to green the desert. They wanted to show by their presence that they could make the land better, that they could be a benefit to the world, right, to the land, that they could bring all their you know, smarts and cosmopolitan ideas and scientific knowledge to bear to create a whole new world in what they saw as a definitely poor and backward part of the planet, right? They're part of the planet, but very poor and backward at that point in time. So there was an enormous moral and intellectual and national investment in this idea of greening the desert. Right? So I think if we don't understand just how much the Israeli body politic absorbs this idea of we are a nation of farmers, we eat from the land, the idea of manna, right? This whole connection to creating agricultural produce, um, then we don't understand it. But what we then have to understand is it got commercialized. Right? Then Israel figured out, hey, you know what? Our big growing season is right when Europe doesn't have anything green to eat. And we can make a lot of money by supplying them with fruit in the wintertime. Right? Started off with Jaffa oranges and has now become multi, multi billion dollar business. And cut flowers as well. You know, people in Amsterdam want to have pretty flowers when it's not particularly flower growing season in Amsterdam. Well, just like we get all of our produce in the wintertime from Mexico and from South America, they get most of their stuff from Turkey and from Israel. Right? So it's become a very uh, lucrative, export-centered, commercial agriculture uh, economy in for a certain small number of actors, right? And they are a very, very uh, important lobby in the Israeli body politic. The irony is that they use about 60% of Israel's water, but they only represent 2 to 3% of Israeli GDP, right? So the idea of the agricultural powerhouse is actually in many ways far more powerful than the reality. So the, the, the irony is that you have Israel, a water poor state, exporting its most precious rare resource to Europe, which has plenty of water. 
right? So that virtual export of water in the form of agricultural produce is something that's unsustainable in the long term. And Israel recognizes that, but they still have this very strong lobby that wants not only do they get 60% of the water, but they get it at a subsidized price. So on the one hand, you have this huge agricultural, commercial uh, um, um, institution um, taking 60% of the water and exporting it. And on the other side, you have Palestinians who can't get access to the water that they need. Right? That's, again, part of the frustration. So that's how water is political. Right? Water is political because it's a resource that can be controlled like oil, like natural gas, like timber, like anything else. And the right to exploit that resource is something that people will fight over. In this case, it's also something that people control very effectively. And because they can control it effectively, that means that they can control people effectively. The implications for the future and the social implications, I think, are really key. Because, as I said, there might just barely be enough water to go around if it were shared equitably, which it's not. Um, however, these, this is a region of the world with very high population growth. And there is no way that the uh, current population growth can um, subsist on the amount of water that's available. It requires the continued depletion of the aquifers, which then degrades the aquifers, and you end up in a very, very bad place in a very, very short time. Right? Scientists, in fact, were surprised at how quickly the Gaza aquifer became totally salinated. Um, three, four years ago, I was hearing that it would be undrinkable in 10 years. And here we are three or four years later, and it's already gone. Gone. And it is irreplaceable. You can't unsalinate an aquifer. It's dead. And that could very easily happen to the other two as well. OK. All right, I want to get past all the words and get to the pictures. Um, so um, yeah, I talked about all of this except for climate change. And I want to come back to climate change, because that's another piece that's, that's uh, making things worse in the long run. right? So not only do we have burgeoning populations, but we have climate change that is, is actually going to exacerbate um, the aridity problems that are already there. OK, so again, this is a look at the, uh, where the groundwater, the aquifers are on the West Bank. Um, and here you can see, oh, sorry, this is the Jordan River Valley. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so you can see, this is what I wanted to show you, is that um, here we have, again, the Dan, the Hezbani, and the Banyas coming down into, uh, here it's Tiberias Lake, see? So every map I'll show you, but we'll have a different name. Um, and this is where you can see the Israeli national water carrier, Mikarot, taking the water out in these huge pipes and bringing it down into um, the, uh, goes down into the Negev and um, provides drinking water for the population of Israel, right? An enormous part of the drinking water of Israel, it comes from the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan River is really interesting because, um, you know, I certainly remember when I was a kid going to church intermittently um, that we sang about the Jordan River, which was deep and wide, right? And I was going to get something on the other side, see, intermittent. Um, but when I was growing up, the Jordan River was like the Mississippi in my head, right? This was a big, big, important, historically vital Big river, right? Um, not so much, right? Um, and the problem is, I mean, I think people would be more concerned and interested in this issue if they knew that, but they don't. In fact, the Jordan River was only ever a big creek for us here in water-rich America. And now it's kind of more like a drainage ditch, at least south of the Sea of Galilee, OK? Um, I could jump across it in many places. Um, and especially, and I was there in March, which is the, the rainy season, right? So it was raining, and I still could have jumped across the, the Jordan River, okay? Um, in the summertime, it's pretty much dry, 
right? Um, at its best, it's at 5% of its historic flow today. So it has lost 95%. And in fact, I would argue more than that, and I'll show you. The other thing is that nobody knows this because it's a militarized border zone, right? So this is all area C. This is all area that Israel controls. It's the border with Jordan. And even though Israel and Jordan have a peace treaty, um, they're not real good friends. So um, it's a very, very strictly controlled border. There are only three places where you can cross the Jordan River where you can actually see it, right? So nobody knows. Most West Bank Palestinians, <coughs> sorry, uh, under a certain age have never seen the Jordan River because they can't get there. They're not allowed to get anywhere near it, right? So Palestinians in the West Bank can't access it. Um, development of the river, of course, is very much restricted. Uh, access to it for environmental reasons is very much restricted because it's a military zone, which means that it's easy for unscrupulous people to use it as a dumping zone, right? So if you're building an industry somewhere uh, in the West Bank, it's very easy to just let your off effluent go into the river because nobody can check. It's off limits. <coughs> Sorry. I just wanted to show you here is one of the migratory birds um, who's trying to still find uh, um, water and uh, you know, a way to survive. Um, but it's very difficult for these migratory birds, especially those that commonly eat fish, um, because there are no fish left <laughs> in the Jordan River. Um, and so it's really difficult for them to find sustenance. Um, and it's had a real toll on these migrating populations, because by the time they get to the northern end of the Rift Valley, they're already very tired. And um, there's a, a high rate of birds dying and not making the full migration because they don't have clean water to drink or they can get diseases from the water or they simply can't find enough food because nothing else can live on it. Here's some of the other birds. Um, this is at the Peace River area, which is actually a place where um, Palestinians, uh, Israelis, and Jordanians have come together to create um, a space where the Yarmouk and the Jordan Rivers come together that's supposed to symbolize uh, working together to try and clean up the Jordan. Um, all right, so wait, I wanted to show you this first. Oh, come on. All right, I'll go. So my poor computer is so tired. It doesn't want to. I'll go back. I'll do it the way I said I would. Okay, so this is the Sea of Galilee or Lake Kinneret. Um, it, and it is very much depleted. The water level used to be much higher. It's actually now below the red line, uh, below the danger zone, uh, even though this past winter was actually a very wet winter. Um, before that, there were seven years of drought, and um, the water was getting to the point where uh, the water coming out of the lake was actually getting saline, because many of the springs that feed it are actually slightly saline themselves. So there was so little fresh water coming into the lake that the water coming out of it was beginning to poison crops and to represent a health danger for everyone in Israel and uh, the West Bank, etc., who drank it. Here's one of the springs on the side of the lake. You can actually see the water bubbling up here. I was there in a relatively dry winter, um, so it was very easy to see these springs, and you could actually taste, this is a saline spring, so you could actually taste that it was slightly salty. And then when you, just as you come uh, uh, out of Tiberias, off of um, the Sea of Galilee, um, you get to a very important tourist site for uh, the Israeli economy. It's called the baptismal site on the Jordan River. Right? So what does that mean? What baptismal site is that? John the Baptist. You would think. You would think this is where John the Baptist baptized Jesus, right? Because that's, when we think of baptism on the River Jordan, that's kind of probably the first one that springs to mind, right? For many of us. In fact, it is not. It is the baptismal site on the Jordan River. But it is not the baptismal site of Jesus on the Jordan River. It is a um, touristic area created to take the tourists to so that they can have the experience of being baptized in the Jordan just like Jesus. And nobody tells them that it's not where Jesus was baptized. So if they're, if they're, you know, big on their biblical geography, they know that this happened at Bethany, and they will notice that Yardenit is 
not Bethany, right? Um, and at some point they may look at a map and find out that there is a place called Bethany, much closer to the Dead Sea, down the Jordan River, which is in fact where Jesus was baptized, um, and that's not where they are. But for the most part, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tourists who come here and spend a lot of money in the very large and aggressively stocked gift shop um, do not know that they are not at the site where Jesus was baptized. So when you come into this place, um, it's, um, you have... These pens, and I, I don't mean that in a um, pejorative at all. They're metal pens with, um, so you can get like six or seven, maybe eight different preachers or leaders, religious leaders of these different groups baptizing their folks at a time, right? So it's a real assembly line. So you have to buy the white robe, which it's free to come into the site, but the robe costs you 30 shekels. Um, so you buy the robe, and then you come in, and we had an American group, a Korean group, um, a group from Lithuania. Um, it was a slow day, so there were only like three or four in the water at that time. Um, but they're all right next to each other, and they're all talking, and it's, it's, a, it's really an amazing experience, and it's very powerful for people. I mean, they're all, they're weeping. It's a deeply, deeply religious experience. And if you know that they think they're somewhere that they're not, it's kind of heartbreaking, right? I mean, you, you want them to have this authentic experience that they're not quite having. On the other hand, if they think they're having it, <laughs> it was a moral dilemma. I don't know. Okay, so this is this beautiful place where you have this, okay? So the water comes out of the Sea of Galilee. It's in fact filtered before it goes into this section of the river, which is all very carefully planted. It's beautiful, it's green, you have these overhanging trees, the water is beautiful, except, and I didn't put in all my pictures, I should have. Um, there's, they have a problem now, which is that there's a lot of, um, you guys have Canada geese here, right? They have the equivalent problem that you have on golf courses with Canada geese with another imported animal. Has anybody know? Has anybody been there? They have nutrias. You guys maybe don't have them here? No? Down south. I know. Down south, there's, but they're, they're spreading like ticks. Nutrias are a, a, a beaver like animal with bright orange teeth. Um, they're kind of a cross between a beaver and a muskrat. They breed like rabbits which is why some enterprising Israeli uh, entrepreneur took a breeding pair to Israel because their fur is waterproof, right? They're water animals and very warm. So they're like, um, no, no, no. What's the one people raise to? Chinchillas. chinchillas, thank you. It's the equivalent of a chinchilla, right? It was like the big craze to raise nutria so that you could make fur coats from them, right? Except... <laughs> Those big teeth, they get through cages really well, so the nutria escaped, found their way to the Jordan River, and now there's a huge nutria population. So we probably saw a couple dozen of them swimming around, and they're trapped aggressively to keep them away from the tourists, right? Um, so aside from the nutria, is that one of them over there? Probably, I think there's one over in those logs. Um, the, you have this beautiful bucolic setting. Okay, um, and that's what everybody talks about as the, the baptismal site. If you go about half a mile downstream, however, you see this. And now you can't get there easily. Um, we had to go through um, the backs of people's farms and got the truck stuff and all of that. But if you know where to go, you come down about half a mile downstream and you see this. This is the end of the Jordan River. There is nothing flowing from here across this earthenware dam, not a single drop. Every drop of this potable water is being sucked up in these pipes and goes into the Israeli National Water Carrier System, right? Nothing comes through unless there's a storm and an overflow drain, okay? But nothing is reaching this pipe at all. So nothing flowing south? Nothing flows south from here. Wow. Not a drop. On the other side of that earthenware dam, however, there is flow. This flows. This is raw, untreated sewage going straight into the riverbed. Now, I heard um, from somebody a couple of months ago that they actually finally have put a sewage treatment plant in. So instead of this, bla there's black water here and brown water 
here. So this is sewage, sewage. This is um, runoff from washing machines and so you see all the suds here? See all this? So there's brown water and there's black water. Um, the idea is that the brown water was being uh, now treated. However, that means that the, after it's treated, it goes back into the agricultural system and it doesn't come back into the riverbed at all. So the good thing is the sewage isn't going into the riverbed. The bad thing is nothing is. Nothing. Right? So just south of the Sea of Galilee, there is no Jordan River. Yeah? My question was exactly where we are here with that case. We're saying we're just south of the Sea of Galilee. Let's look. Let's look because Barbara loves to look. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so here we are. This is the Sea of Galilee, right? So this is the headwaters of the Jordan up here. Here's the Sea of Galilee. Here's Tiberias, and here's the baptism site that we just saw. Let's see if I can actually pinpoint it. So we see this nice water coming down here. And I think this is the dam. So here is, yeah, they're just building right there, see? That's that big white tank we saw. These are all those pipes. And then this is where all the sewage is coming in. In fact, see all that white there? That's probably all those sets, right? So all the stuff in the river down here is sewage. When you get a little further down, you do get some runoff from uh, agricultural uh, from irrigation, from rainwater, comes down into the valley from all of this commercial af agriculture, right? But there's no flow from the tributaries anymore, okay? Until you get down to where the Yarmouk comes in, you, get, you have more springs that start to feed it again, but then as soon as water comes in, it's taken out, right? So most of the springs get capped, wells get dug to try and pull the water out before it just goes to waste in the Jordan River Basin, right? So by the time you get all the way down to, well, let me show you what it looks like here. Oh, why does it do that every time? This is the actual site, they tell me, where Jesus was baptized. Um, this is the Jordanian side. This is the Israeli side. Um, I couldn't quite jump over here. Um, now, it had been, again, this is the rainy season. This is the highest point it gets, okay? This is raining for, you know, the end of three or four months of rain. And... Um, I don't think it would have come higher than my, maybe my hips walking across. I mean, the one guy I saw who was out here was, you know, well below his hips. Um, and this is, you know, um, open from the Israeli side only two days a year, right? Two days a year they open it to the public. Most of the time it's closed off. Actually, they do open it occasionally for visiting heads of state. Nelson Mandela came, gosh, probably, uh, I want to say 10 years ago, something like that, 12 years ago, um, and came to visit Israel and came to be baptized. Very religious man, came to be baptized at the actual baptism site, um, which was a bad idea because he ended up in the hospital with infections on his skin from the water, which is... That polluted it is. So just so you can see, this one is taken from the baptism site on the Jordan River at Yardinit. This one is taken here, right? So now, of course, that's just sediment. That doesn't really show you what's living in there, but I'm not drinking it, right? <laughs> so, um, so normally when this is open, when they have a group here, you have guards with guns all along here. Because again, this is a military zone. Right? You're not allowed here from the, the Israeli side. And it's one of the places where people can cross from Jordan into Israel if they can make it over, right? So it's very, very heavily fortified. Okay? Can you state the name of that? Uh, Bethany. 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 B-E-T-H-A-N-Y. 
is the, is the site. And the Jordanians have taken a totally different approach. They've built it up into a kind of tourist attraction, which people haven't figured out yet, that you can't get to Bethany from the Israeli side, but you can get there from the Jordanian side, and all of the various, you know, the Greek Orthodox, the Armenian Catholics, the Catholics, the various Protestants, everybody has built a church there now. So there are all of these churches rebuilt, and, um, you know, there's, there's a whole lovely pathway that goes through all of these things so that you can get there from the Jordanian side. And the Jordanian side is actually, there's a little bit of a swampy stream that comes into the river at this point. So from the Jordanian side, you get this very pleasant kind of thing. And then you end up here. And it's very, suddenly very stark and constrained. And, you know, the whole experience is leading you to the Jordan. And you get there. And I just, I can't imagine what these you know, tourists think when they're building this thing up in their head and they've got all of these golden churches and all of these things on the path and then they get down there to <laughs> this creek, Where's right? Where's the Allenby Crossing? Huh? Where is the Allenby Crossing? Oh, further north than this. Yeah. yeah. So it's even smaller up there. Oh, yes. Yeah. So this is what it looks like on the right. I'm going to show you this one. This is... Um, a crossing near where the Israelis had originally built a big dam on the, the Yarmouk River, right where it comes into the um, uh, Jordan. Um, and this, so there used to be, here's a bridge, there used to be a lot of commerce across here. This was a real point of, of trade, right? Um, so here you can see this is where it was damaged in the war and the railway line is rotting. But I wanted to show you this picture. This is the Jordan. There, see it? I should get out of the way because there's not very much of it over there to see. That little white bit is the Jordan. I want to show you what it looked like in a flood in the 1920s. Well, not, I mean, the normal. This is what it looks like at the same time of year. That is, this is March at the end of the rainy season when all of the um, rains are coming down from all of the tributaries. So we've gone from this in March to this. Right? That looks like more than 95% gone to me, but that's just me. That's what it looks like from a little higher up. Um, again, you know, this is a tree. So that's how, I mean, definitely I could jump up here. And I'm not that athletic, really. So it's kind of sad. Um, very much, very much depleted from what it was. All right, how are we doing? Oh dear. Okay, let me um, let me just. A lot of this I've talked about. I just want to show you some of the pictures. Just to again, the agricultural problem um, is you know all of these crops. And when we were driving through bananas and citrus trees and tomatoes, and huge greenhouses of cut flowers of you know flowers for the flower shops. Um, these are all very very water intensive crops. I mean there are crops you can grow that are less water intensive that would be more suitable for the area. But they don't earn you as much money in the European market, right? So Europeans want their Jaffa oranges, and Europeans want red ripe tomatoes in the middle of winter, don't we all, right? So the problem is that um, this agricultural lobby that's grown up around getting wealthy from this, um, and, and doing it all with subsidized water. I mean, that's the irony, is that they refuse to pay market price for the water but then they get wealthy by charging high prices for this produce in Europe. So here you see a couple of, uh, uh, we went to this kibbutz, a couple of the early founders of the kibbutz growing their melons in the desert. You know, this was the big national pride. And here you can see the very large scale kind of commercial agriculture. So you have, you know, banana farms. And the banana farms, I mean, it's such a water intensive crop that they actually put plastic sheeting over these huge banana fields to keep the moisture in so that it doesn't just immediately evaporate when they, <coughs> when they irrigate, right? Now, um, the, you know, I have to say that the, and here you can see again, Large-scale agriculture, and then you have, it's really hard to see it on here, but that's the Jordan. You, so you have this military zone in the middle, and then you have Jordan on the other side. It's hard to see. But the, the, the agricultural zone here goes right down to where all the military fences start. Um, but the, the Israelis are actually very good about 
conserving water for agricultural purposes. It has to be said. There are, there are greenhouses. They do have sheets over the bananas. You know, one would argue that you, you maybe shouldn't be growing the bananas, but they have drip, drip agri- uh, irrigation, which they pioneered. Um, they're very smart about figuring out ways to do it. They use wastewater, re, uh, recycled wastewater, to irrigate a fair amount of the commercial agriculture. But the problem is that when they use this recycled wastewater, it's not clean of all the contaminants, right? So I'm, you know, not the biological contaminants necessarily, but it has mineral contaminants, etc., which then do what? They percolate right back down to the aquifer. So even some of the technologies that have helped the Israelis use less of the groundwater resources mean that they're polluting the groundwater resources that still remain. So there, there are no perfect solutions yet. And we'll talk about desalination in a second. Um, so just to give you a sense, the, the World Health Organization says that every person should have at least a minimum of 100 liters of water a day for good health. And the absolute minimum is 50 liters a day, right? That's the, the lowest, it's like the difference between the upper end of the poverty level and abject poverty, right? Palestinians are supposed to get 60 to 80 liters a day. That's in the Oslo Accords, but they don't get that water, largely because the pipes that um, they want to come in on are uh, very old, degraded, leaking, were not installed very well. Um, so they, wo- they lose about 50% of the water as it grows through the pipes in the West Bank, right, and in Gaza. So about 50% of the water is lost. Also, people tap into the pipes when they can illegally. Right, so you have some people who get the water illegally, and other people who, um, you know, can't get the water at all. So there's this, you know, there's there's also a, you know, if you want to call it corruption, Palestinians would probably call it resistance. But there's some people who can illegally access the water, and then there are other people who can't get the water at all. The problem is that the Palestinians pay for the water that they're supposed to get, right? So they don't pay for what comes out of their tap they pay for the amount that they're allocated, even if all that water isn't coming through the tap. So that's, again, another grievance on top of it. And some neighborhoods, both because of infrastructure problems like that, sometimes because of political pressure by uh, the Israeli military or civil authorities, get as little as 16 liters a day. And some of those communities are, for example, the Bedouin communities, which the Israelis would like to settle, right? And control more. So. Um, some neighborhoods get 16 liters a day a person, right? And by that I mean they don't get 16 liters a day, right? For three hours, one day a week, or one day a week, two weeks, you can take your allocated amount of water and put it in your tank, right? Um, the other thing is that when there's a drought, the water allocation to Palestinian areas is often cut off so that settlers can continue to get enough water pressure to be supplied. So the settlements in the West Bank, which have grown so enormously over the last couple of decades, have actually made the problem much worse for Palestinians, especially over the seven-year drought, because they pull so much water. Um, and the, it, it actually, in order to protect their right to that water, because they're a very politically important voting bloc, um, Palestinians get even less. Right at a time when, of course, they need it the most. Um, so the water that gets chucked in is not only 10 times as expensive, but of course it doesn't always get there because it gets held up at checkpoints or roadblocks or whatever, right? So all of these things mean that Palestinians live in a situation of desperate water insecurity. I loved all of these. I was going to bore you with like a series of 10 political posters from the West Bank, but I decided not to. Um, But this one I thought was really interesting because uh, what do you think is going on here if you're going to guess? Permits maybe? Maybe they're trying to get permits to dig wells. It actually says you have the right to get water to drink. Right? We all have the right to have drinking water. But you have a duty to pay your water bill. (laughs) So this is people lined up to pay their water bill. And it's the Palestinian Authority trying to encourage people to pay for water rather than take it out of the pipes or just ignore it. That is that there, you know, where some Palestinians would refuse to pay their water bills 
as an act of resistance, the Palestinian Authority is trying to get them to pay their water bills so that they can keep water flowing. Right? So it's, it's again, about the heterogeneity of uh, communities within Palestine. Um, I won't talk too much about the Dead Sea because it's not usable water anyway by the time it gets there. Um, but I just wanted to, again, this is an, a really important lobby because um, you guys have all seen the Dead Sea sea salts in all the stores. Right? Well, this is the big industry that I exists now. Um, and if you look at the Dead Sea, and we'll go back and look at it in a, in, uh, a minute, um, it's actually, it, it looks like a really bizarre elongated eight. And the bottom half of it, the, the southern basin, is dead. It's not a sea anymore. There's no, the, all the water in it is piped in there. It's basically just industrial drying ponds so that they can get salts for industrial purposes and to sell to people at Bed Bath & Beyond or, you know, the body shop or wherever. Okay, um, I wanted to show you this one because... This is, you see these two marks on the wall? See the people here for scale, okay? So we just got off the bus and we saw these marks on the wall. And this is where in 1902, not that long ago, an American survey team reached out of their rowboat with their paintbrush and marked the level of the lake, of the sea, of the Dead Sea. So this is where the Dead Sea was. This is that mark in the 1960s, okay? This is the road, I couldn't quite get it all. So I'm standing on the road, and that's the Dead Sea down there in the distance, right? That's how much the Dead Sea has been depleted, right? Um, and it shows you not just, not just it's bad for the Dead Sea, but that's how little water is actually flowing through the Jordan. Okay, so this is the aquifers, we looked at that. Um, I think I told you all of this already. Yes. So this is a Palestinian woman who is, um, you know, this is one of the cisterns that she's filled probably from a water truck and she's trying, she's irrigating what few crops she has, vegetable crops, by hand from this cistern, right? So this is one of the ways that people try and make this work. Here's one of the water trucks. So again, I mean, you can imagine what the water tastes like coming out of a truck that's been, you know, driving around the West Bank for a couple of days. Yeah. 